Well, hello everyone. Um, good morning from New York. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, I'm Adriana Usan. I head the Singapore International Arbitration Center or SIAC's Americas Office, or sorry, SIAC, as I've been learning more um, these days that the world pronounces it that way. Um, as many of you may be aware, um, SIAC has opened its Americas office last December. So today we've designed a very practical program specifically for Brazilian in-house counsel. And the aim of this webinar is to provide an overview of international arbitration, why this mode of dispute resolution could be an option for Brazilian parties and provide key highlights of case administration at SIAC. Joining us today are experts in the field of arbitration. We are very fortunate to have on our panel, Ms. Karina Goldberg, a member of the SIAC Court of Arbitration and a partner at Ferro Castro Neves Daltro and Gumide, Mr. Flavio Spaca, partner at Matos Filho, Mr. Joaquim de Paya Munes, partner at Trench Rossi E. Watanabe, and of course, Mr. Kevin Nash, our Deputy Registrar and Center Director. So we hope um, to have a meaningful exchange with you and to advance the dialogue. We have allocated time for question and answer at the end of the program, but please feel free to ask questions at any time and clarifications directly to us by clicking on the raise hand function and unmuting yourself or turning your video on um, however you like it. You can also ask questions in Portuguese. Um, alternatively, you may also use the chat feature to ask questions or provide comments. Now, I am pleased to hand this over to Joaquim, who will be moderating the panel. Joaquim, please. Uh, thank you. Good morning, Brazil. Uh, good evening in Singapore and in Asia. It's a pleasure to, uh, to be here moderate an event from SIAC. SIAC, one of the top three arbitration uh, chambers in the world, is the fastest growing uh, arbitration center worldwide. And it's very important that we in Brazil become aware uh, of the work of, of CIARP. Uh, China has become number one uh, trade partner of, of Brazil. Uh, and the 21st century is the third the, the century of the Asian uh, countries. More and more Brazilian companies uh, are doing business and that's a reality. Like China's number one trading partner, India's number uh, five, Isaac uh, countries are top, many of them are top uh, 20. So we are not speaking of something theoretically. That's our re reality. Every day we are doing business uh, further than we were uh, a few years uh, before. And you have to understand which are the leading uh, institutions in this new world. And SIAC is uh, the best uh, arbitration uh, chamber uh, located in, in Asia and is really uh, one of the leading uh, chambers uh, worldwide. So it's very important that we in Brazil are aware of the work of SIAC, how it works, uh, and the importance of the arbitration clause. Uh, to submit disputes on international trade to, to arbitration. Uh, Adrian asked me to, uh, to say a few words about why arbitration uh, in international contracts. And I'll answer that. That's not a good to have. It's a must have. Uh, it's practicable not to have uh, arbitration clause when you're dealing with international uh, trade. Uh, first, because uh, especially now that Brazil has even more uh, big powerhouse in uh, mineral and agricultural commodities, uh, have a very strong industrial basis also exporting uh, worldwide. You cannot imagine those kinds of, of disputes not being submitted to, to arbitration for many reasons. First, uh, because you don't want to be stuck uh, doing uh, litigating in local courts and are not criticizing uh, the local courts outside of Brazil, just a matter of transactional costs. Like you can be anywhere in Asia or in Africa or uh, uh, in Middle East uh, in local courts with local lawyers 
uh, it's much cheaper and safer to have arbitration and a neutral uh, venue with an agreed upon uh, law. The second uh, upside of arbitration I make must have is about uh, enforcement and possibility of, of choice of law. When you deal, uh, uh, most jurisdictions have restrictions for application of foreign law in local courts. And that's the case of, of Brazil. Even in Brazil, you can choose foreign law in arbitration, but you cannot choose foreign law in, in domestic uh, contracts or contracts with uh, seat in, in Brazil. The venue is a judicial court and the contract was signed in Brazil. So uh, even in Brazil, it's not that easy to, to choose foreign law. But if there is a very interesting research from, uh, from Queen Mary University about uh, uh, applicable law uh, international contracts. And you see uh, that uh, a big number of contracts are subject to English law, New York law, French and Swiss law. I would say that if at 80% of the contracts subject to, uh, to international trade. Uh, so uh, to guarantee that the, the choice of those law will be upheld, uh, it's something that will only happen if you choose uh, international arbitration. So uh, the first is to have a neutral venue, second, a choice of law, third, and very, very important, the possibility to, uh, to take advantage of the New York, uh, New York uh, Convention. The New York Convention can enforce an award issued in a contracting country in any of 106 something uh, signatory countries. So that's very easy to get an award issue in Brazil, uh, in Singapore, in Paris, or in Australia, and in force anywhere else in the world. Considering that we're dealing with international trade when I have uh, export of, uh, of goods and you can, uh, the goods could be somewhere else. Uh, the possibility to enforce outside your home jurisdiction, to enforce outside your, uh, uh, the venue, it, it's quite relevant, especially because you don't have a similar treaty on judicial awards. So you can, okay, you can win uh, a case in Brazil, but if the goods are in Singapore, if the goods are in China, what we're gonna do, we're gonna depend on uh, the internal interpretations of uh, the practice of the local courts. We don't want to be uh, stuck uh, with the goodwill of local court on international arbitration uh, with the New York Convention, we will guarantee that you will be able to, to enforce. And the track records are quite good. That's a very interesting website uh, managed by Albert Vandenberg, uh, newyorkconvention.com, with case law enforcement of awards on the New York, uh, on the New York Convention. You see that in almost all jurisdictions, the, 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 the precedent is law quite favorable for enforcement of, of the award. So that's a very, very strong tool. Uh, the fourth uh, upside of arbitration is speed. Some, uh, some courts like Brazilian courts and Indian courts, I'm saying India because it's the fifth largest country in the world and very large user of SIAC. Uh, you can take from 12 to 15 years uh, in a court procedure when uh, the average, uh, they want to, uh, uh, Adrian and Kevin will tell about uh, the average speed of SIAC uh, arbitration is much faster. Even using Brazilian standards, uh, the average speed of an arbitration in Brazil is two years compared to an average uh, speed of uh, 10 years uh, in, a, in a judicial uh, court. Uh, and and uh, last but not least, uh, arbitration is business oriented. You can choose arbitrators that know the industry practice. Us as a lawyer, you know that we're dealing with energy deals like oil and gas has a certain practice. Power, power, uh, power purchase agreements has different practice. You're dealing with uh, agricultural commodities. There's a, uh, also a very different practice. If you go to uh, to local courts, the, the judges could be very knowledgeable of the law, but they will not be knowledgeable of the, uh, the practice. But it can bring uh, people in arbitration that know the specificities of this, that area of industry, that area, that area of economy, and uh, will be more business oriented. For all these reasons, 
uh, you see, there's a very interesting book about the history of arbitration of about the, the name, but tells us that the, the economic boom after the Second World War was a boom of, the, of international arbitration. Because you can only uh, have this level of international trade if you have arbitration. It's not a coincidence that just after the Second World War, we have uh, the New York Convention enacted. And it's not a coincidence that uh, in the center of this uh, uh, huge development of the Asian countries, SIAC became a leading institution and maybe very soon become the largest institution in the world. Uh, so you have to go to arbitration and SIAC is probably the best place. And then I have to understand better uh, SIAC. So uh, I ask, uh, uh, Kevin to to give an overview about uh, SIAC and, and how it differs from other institutions. Thank, thank you, Joachim. Uh, it, it's great it's great to be here. Sometimes I think the best way to introduce an institution to new users is to give some examples of our case management experience. And because we have Adriana here, our head of Americas, she used to be in the secretariat, then went out into private practice. So I might use some examples on cases that we worked on together. And I think in particular, when Adriana was at the secretary, she handled most of our investment cases. So I can think of one case in particular where there were many back and forths in the scrutiny process. And I can think of quite a few evenings where we were working around the clock to be able to review an award and then get it back to the tribunal. And obviously in cases involving states, state controlled organizations, uh, this takes on particular importance. And from a timing standpoint, when you're looking at SEAC, what we're trying to offer is the best case management in the world, but we're gonna do it faster and more cost effectively than any other institution. So we're always looking at how we can adhere to the fundamental tenets of arbitration. And if you think about it from an in-house perspective, what you wanna have is the security in your dispute resolution clause of knowing that if we're choosing arbitration, we're choosing SEAC arbitration, it can be done quickly and cost effectively. So I can think of certain timelines in a clause, one that stands out is a 120 day clause that we had. And because we have this scrutiny process, the, the tribunal submitted its draft award on day 119. And then we had to review the award and turn it around within a day. I can re recall traveling back to Canada and being in an airport in transit and we got a new notice of arbitration. And the notice of arbitration again had very particular timelines this time, 14 days from the constitution of the tribunal, the award had to be rendered. And this was over the holidays as well. And so right away, I was thinking, who do we know that really likes arbitration, that is willing to give up their holidays to be able to deal with this case where the parties have agreed that the award has to be rendered in 14 days? And I can think of lots of cases, again, where you have the secretariat working around the, the clock. There was an emergency arbitration that we had last year in the context of remote hearings, where the council was observing the hearing on emergency interim relief. So it was there that hearing went deep into the night uh, the, the emergency arbitrator then submitted the draft emergency order. The next day, we scrutinized it, and then it went uh, over to the party. So this ability to have a, a, an injunction uh, effectively done overnight. So that's what we're trying to offer as an institution. And it's interesting when you think about an institution, ultimately as a party, you just want everything to work. Sometimes when an institution is operating most effectively, it's because the arbitration is just running smoothly. You don't want to notice the institution too much to, to a certain degree. Now at SIC, if you've used ICC arbitration, I think that you'll find that the rules and the overall structure are quite similar. This is structured administration where we are taking care of the arbitration from the filing of the notice of arbitration until the eventual scrutiny of the award. We'll get into some of the specific features uh, of the rules, but uh, ICC and SIC are quite similar. Some subtle differences in terms of our fast track proceedings, joinder and consolidation, but the overall construction of the rules is quite similar. And I guess finally, the ultimate test for an institution and where SEAC does very well is the knowledge that international parties can come to Singapore or can choose SIC and they can be sure that they'll have a fair adjudication 
of their dispute. The way I look at SEAC and Singapore in particular, it is known that the rule of law is applied without fear or favor. SEAC is independent, neutral. You can be confident in bringing your disputes to SEAC and getting that fair resolution of, of your dispute. And one of the most heartening things about arbitration during the COVID-19 pandemic is the fact that everything has moved to the virtual space. So when we're looking at the appointment of arbitrators, the overall conduct of the proceedings, particularly with Brazilian parties, the world has become very small. So we can appoint an arbitrator based in Brazil for a dispute uh, that is being administered by SIC. No one ever has to travel to Singapore. And I think that that's kind of the way that we're going in arbitration. You can choose SIC, uh, even if there's no connection to Singapore or Asia, and no one needs to ever travel uh, to Singapore. Um, and I guess also, I think what's been interesting about the SEAC experience is how quickly it has grown. So in 1991, we had two cases in our first year of operation. In 2020, we had more than a thousand cases. So we've moved from a regional institution to an institution in terms of caseload, and almost all of our cases are international, one of the largest and busiest institutions in the world. What we've tried to do uh, during this period of growth is maintain the same level of customer service that we have when we were a small regional institution. I think for users of arbitration, one thing uh, that they really enjoy about SIC is the accessibility of the secretariat. So we are working around the clock and we're also available. As a user of arbitration, I think sometimes where frustrations can come in is where the institution is taking time on something and there's no feedback and there's not a dialogue between the institution and uh, the council. So the SIC secretariat is accessible, working around the clock and making sure that these arbitrations are running as quickly and cost effectively as possible. Uh, thank you. Uh, so now I, I want to, uh, to hear from uh, Adriana a little bit about the work, how, how does the secretariat work and how the rules work? Thank you, Joachim. So um, Kevin touched on a bit on case management. We're really a hands-on institution in terms of case management. The secretariat, um, headed by, by Kevin, actually handles the day-to-day -day administration of all the cases filed with SIAC. And this role consists mainly in assisting the parties throughout the entire process from determining from the moment a party files a notice of arbitration, whether we have jurisdiction first to administer a case, to selecting the arbitrator for the parties if they can't choose for themselves, to collecting deposits, um, handling the financial management of a dispute, and supervising generally the proper conduct of the arbitration proceedings. And like what Kevin was saying, we're very accessible. Um, if parties feel that there is some sort of delay, we are here, we're ready to communicate with the tribunal and the parties to bridge any gap to make sure that the process runs fast and smoothly. <clears throat> I, I want to highlight here that the jurisdictional function of deciding the merits of a dispute resides with the arbitral tribunal and not with SIC. Our role is to choose um, the arbitrator if the parties cannot um, choose for themselves, and we'll be um, discussing this further um, on the appointment process of SIC. But in the meantime, briefly, I would just like to also say that we have a panel of arbitrators that we have vetted, and that panel, it's there, um, it's available on, on our websites and parties can choose from, from any one of them. Um, our secretariat um, comprises of international disputes lawyers who are qualified in both common law and civil law jurisdictions, and they speak more than 10 languages. So we can handle, say, Chinese cases, um, um, cases in Latin America. So it doesn't have to be only um, English um, language cases that we handle. Um, the other thing that Kevin was mentioning was the scrutiny or re review of awards. This is one of the important features that SIC offers, which few institutions in the world offer. Um, and this, um, the, this feature is really important because what we do at SIC is that we review all of the awards issued by our tribunals, not only to catch typographical errors, 
mathematical errors, but to ensure the highest quality of award by providing, or, or sorry, avoiding possible errors and enhancing the likelihood of enforcement. <clears throat> and for us, this has resulted in a positive track record across several jurisdictions. So Kevin also mentioned that we are almost similar to ICC. I think um, institutions have almost similar rules. We're seeing more, more similarities, but um, when parties are probably choosing a, an institution, they might want to see there are some nuances in how we apply these rules. So I'll, I'll give a quick highlight on some of our costs and time-saving tools that we've written in our rules. We also keep updating our rules and we're in the midst of um, our rule revision process at the moment. So first, um, in our current rules, the 2016 SIC rules, we have what we call the emergency arbitrator procedure. So this procedure um, is for cases where a party cannot wait for the main tribunal to be constituted and is looking for an urgent interim relief. So for instance, if a counterparty if you want to stop your co counterparty from disposing assets for a period of time or stop them from calling a bank guarantee or not to destroy documents, and you cannot wait for your main tribunal <clears throat> to be appointed. So what SIC does in this process is to appoint an emergency arbitrator within 24 hours, regardless if it is a weekend or a holiday. So under this procedure, um, the emergency arbitrator also has to issue an interim order or award within two weeks from his or her appointment. But based on our experience, um, the interim order or award actually comes out earlier than two weeks. And being the first institution in Asia um, to introduce this provision in the market some 10 years ago, we have the advantage of experience. We've handled about 120, 20, 22 applications, sorry, to date. We also have um, what we call the expedited or fast track procedure, where an award must be issued by the arbitrator within six months from the time of his or, or her appointment. And this is a very popular mechanism at SIAC. We have received more than 600 applications since the introduction of this provision in 2010. The, the expedited procedure can be applied by um, a party for if the amount in dispute is under about 4.5 million US dollars, or regardless of the quantum, if both the parties agree, or in cases of exceptional urgency. So some example of ex exceptional urgency um, that was, was able to go through this pr provision would be, for instance, where an applicant has argued that the dispute has been preventing it from performing third-party contracts and it, and it is exposing it to more losses. So in that case, you can also apply for um, an expedited procedure or for the case to be finished in, in six months. Um, so under our rules, the case will be referred to a sole or a single arbitrator, even if the parties agreed that it has to be three, a three-member tribunal. And we did this to ensure that the process would be faster. Um, we also have multi-contract consolidation and join their provisions. And these all serve to save time and cost by streamlining uh, the proceedings. So under our multi-contract provisions, a claimant can file a single notice of arbitration for disputes arising out of multiple contracts. And, and that single notice of arbitration acts as its application to consolidate. Or a, a claimant can also decide to file multiple notices of arbitration and concurrently submit with it an application to consolidate. So those are two ways we can accept multiple um, contract cases. Under our consolidation provision, two or more SIAC cases can be consolidated into one arbitration. If the parties agree, um, if the dispute arises out of the same arbitration agreement or, or different but compatible arbitration agreements. We are different um, with other institutions in, in that we allow the consolidation application to be made not only after a tribunal has been constituted, but also before a tribunal is constituted to allow the parties, all of the parties, to have the opportunity to participate in choosing um, their tribunal. So 
Um, a similar approach um, has been taken in our joinder provisions, which are designed very broadly and could allow both a non-party and a non-signatory to be joined if the parties agree, or if we find that there's prima facie um, that they're bound by the arbitration agreement. So the application similarly may be made um, also by the party prior to the appointment or after the appointment of the tribunal. We also have an express early dismissal mechanism where a party may apply to the tribunal for the dismissal, or sorry, an early dismissal of a claim or a defense that is manifestly without legal merit or manifestly outside the jurisdiction of the tribunal. So for instance, when say a claim is out of time or it has been settled, so this, this mechanism potentially can save time and cost because the parties at the very early stage of the proceeding can is able to strike out any heads of claim or defense that are not good in law or outside um, the four corners of an arbitration agreement instead of having the tribunal deal with these issues all the way until the end of the arbitration. So while everyone um, may agree that tribunals have the inherent power to employ summary disposition. What SIAC has done differently from other institutions is we codified um, this provision in our rules itself. And that makes the parties aware of their rights. It, it gives the tribunal a bit more courage and the enforcement courts more comfort that the, the claims or defenses can actually be dealt with this way. And finally, we also offer a unique service that combines the use of mediation and arbitration. So what we did is we teamed up with our sister organization, the Singapore International Mediation Center, to create a curated ARB, what we call ARB Med ARB protocol. So this is a process where an arbitration is first commenced to say lock in the date against any limitation period. And once the tribunal is constituted in, in the arbitration phase of the proceeding, the case is then referred by SIAC to mediation to the Singapore International Mediation Center. And this is really fast and seamless because the two institutions talk. Um, then parties are given eight weeks to mediate. Now, if the mediation results in a settlement agreement between the parties, the parties then may go back to their already constituted tribunal at SIAC and ask that tribunal to issue a consent arbitral award issued on, on the terms agreed at the mediation, which as we all know, will be enforceable in 168 countries under the New York Convention. Now, if um, mediation is unsuccessful, parties may still go back to their already constituted arbitral tribunal and, and proceed with the arbitration, perhaps with a better sense on the strength of their respective cases. So what we did is we just offered another tool if, if parties want to in, in, include mediation in the whole process and, and try to make it faster. So, so that's a brief highlight of, of our rules, Joaquin. No, that's very interesting because as if you see, you were uh, one of the first to have emergency arbitrators, arbitrators that now is a common feature. Mm -hmm. uh, the first ones to have uh, expedited procedures. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have this med arb, uh, arb med arb protocol that I believe you are the, the only one. So that makes you uh, maybe one of the most innovative powerhouses in, uh, in arbitration. You have some. Uh, features like this early dismissal uh, that I don't know other ins big institutions that have something similar. Uh, and you have the court. So I'd like to hear a little bit about Karina, that's uh, the representative of Latin America in the court. How uh, does the SEAC court work? Thank you so much, Joaquin. Thank you, Adriana. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Flavio. Um, it is, uh, I am delighted to be a member of the court and actually I am fascinated by uh, SIAC. Uh, they, they, they were able to 
develop after seeing all the, the procedural issues that were dealt by the parties in the past uh, 40 years, they were able to codify and to simplify and give uh, efficient, effective answers to users. And I'm, I'm very glad that it, becoming, it is becoming um, that our clients, our in-house um, clients are becoming more and more familiar to uh, the proceedings uh, before. SIAC or SIAC. Um, also, with the pandemic, uh, everybody is getting more acquainted to uh, the virtual world. So arbitration is being uh, is becoming more familiar, for, more familiarized with the virtual world, uh, and it seems that it's going to be uh, easier for users, for Brazilian clients, for Brazilian parties. Uh, that have connections, that have contracts abroad, uh, international contracts, uh, and not necessarily with uh, Asian countries, but um, uh, to be able to have access to SIAC. Um, and one of the big uh, differences from SIAC is the court, right? Um, just like uh, ICC, uh, which is a, a institution that has been practicing uh, in Latin America for a while already, um, this SIAC has a court that is uh, composed by a number of uh, very experienced practitioners in international arbitration. And the issues that the most important procedural issues that are faced by the parties are decided by uh, this court of arbitration instead of like in our domestic institutions that are um, that, that actually are uh, the the, the most uh, famous ones before uh, clients in Brazil, um, usually because of an idea of cost, uh, but also because uh, uh, clients are familiar with uh, um, the work that has been per performed by these uh, domestic institutions that of course we are not criticizing, they are very, um, they, they are very efficient, professional, but SIAC does, has, does have this difference that is the court. So, for example, once the parties have uh, a very hot, hot topic actually regarding uh, uh, international arbitration and the enforcement of awards in Brazil, when the parties have uh, to challenge an arbitrator, um, both before um, the tribunal is constituted or after the arbitral tribunal is constituted, this matter will be decided by the court. So uh, at least three members of the court will deal with the issue. Uh, we'll hear um, the, the reasonings that will be brought by the parties, the clarifications that will be presented by the uh, potential arbitrator or the arbitrator that is already in the arbitral tribunal, and we will render a decision. So one of the issues that my clients used to ask me was uh, in the past, and even ICC has changed it, that, um, and, and some institutions don't. So uh, uh, what do we, how, how can we know which was uh, the, the reasoning of the court of the institution uh, to reject or to accept a challenge? So um, they, they, if, except if the parties don't want to, but most of the parties, uh, from my experience, do want, and the decisions are reasoned. Other very important issues, and Adriana mentioned because they are part of the, the rules of the arbitration, but very important issues that are dealt um, by the members of the court, for example, is the issue on jurisdiction. So it, it is a big concern of our clients uh, if um, they are called to an arbitral proceeding um, that deal with matters that not exactly are encompassed by the arbitration clause. So there is a, a contract, there is an arbitration clause, but the party is uh, bringing different claims that have nothing to do with that clause. So those issues regarding um, the scope of the arbitral, um, of the arbitral clause, um, the existence of an agreement to arbitrate, uh, the jurisdiction of, of the arbitral tribunal, and, and uh, in cases involving, for example, uh, state, the state, or, uh, or public owned companies, this could be a, a, an issue, a, a huge discussion on jurisdiction on whether the parties have consented to arbitrate. Also here in Brazil, um, our arbitration law provides for uh, that uh, uh, stock market companies, so public owned companies can include in their bylaws, the arbitration clause. 
So if the, part, there is, if the parties want to dispute whether um, this clause is binding uh, in, in their relationship, if they have to be a party of that arbitration, they have to participate of that arbitration, the court will issue a decision and the parties can feel comfortable that this decision will be uh, rendered by uh, people that have international experience. Um, and uh, last but not least, uh, also regarding joinders and consolidation, the, the, the court members are called to decide also on those issues. Um, and consolidation matters uh, involve uh, a number of uh, polemic questions on whether uh, um, uh, those uh, contracts, uh, different contracts involving multiple parties uh, can be decided in one single proceeding, what, which is the impact of one relationship over the other. If the parties do not agree to uh, include, for example, um, the holding company that has not signed um, the arbitration, then you have two separate arbitrations, one against the holding company and another one against the subsidiaries if you want to combine those arbitrations. So um, the court members are ready to address all those, those issues. And I think that uh, SIC has been very successful because it has the court as well. Um, I, I think that Kevin can, can let us know, but the number of, uh, of uh, annulments and, and even filings for annulments afterwards have been very small. Uh, very interesting. Karina, just one question before I move on. Uh, how about the timing for those decisions of the court? Yes, the, the secret... The secretary will. Challenges. Yeah, the secretary will invite uh, the members of the court. We choose members of the court to um, to decide, and uh, we will uh, meet in like uh, in the same week, um, and then uh, in fifteen days, the most uh, as as for the experience that I have, uh, we'll we we'll render the decision. Thank you. Uh, I mentioned Kevin. And Kevin uh, has important roles sometimes to, to, to appoint arbitrators. Uh, and people say that arbitration is as good as arbitrators that you appoint. So I want to hear uh, Kevin on, on the appointment of arbitrators and who normally serve as arbitrator uh, in SIAC cases. Sure. So let's, let's think about the different situations where an institution may be called upon to make an appointment. Because at SIC in any institution, one of the fun these fundamental tenets of arbitration is the ability to choose your decider. So say if it's a sole arbitrator tribunal, we always want to invite the parties to jointly agree on a sole arbitrator. Same thing in a three member tribunal, the most typical course would be that each side would nominate their own arbitrator. But when the parties are not able to agree, the situations where the institution may appoint would be an emergency arbitrator, as Adriana canvassed, a sole arbitrator. Uh, th under the SIC rules, it's a default that the institution appoints the third and presiding arbitrator. If you have a non-participating respondent, we might make an appointment on behalf of that non-participating respondent, or in the case of a, a multi-party situation or a multipolar situation, more accurately, following the decision in Dutco, the institution might appoint all three arbitrators. Now, the, the method uh, and who is appointing the arbitrators are quite, is quite important. So under the SIC rules, the appointment process is quite transparent. You have the president or the vice president are, are appointing the arbitrators upon recommendation from the secretariat. So the secretariat, we will put together a list of arbitrators, uh, we'll make a recommendation, and then you will have uh, Lucy Reed, Toby Landau, or Kavinder Bull will then make the appointment. So when we're looking at what factors are taken into consideration when making an appointment, I think the most important factor is that we want to make sure that we're appointing the best arbitrators in the world, wherever they are in the world. So say if you had a Brazilian party uh, and a Chinese party, uh, Brazilian claimant, Chinese respondent, sole arbitrator uh, to be appointed. Now, even though nationality is, is not set out in the commercial rules, as a matter of course, we are always going to be appointing a neutral nationality. And that's not just the nationality in someone's passport, 
That is also the optics of the nationality. We want to make sure that it's a nationality of an arbitrator that is seen to be neutral. We'll certainly be looking at that arbitrator sector experience. We are, for instance, starting to receive a lot of case of fintech cases. Uh, so we want to make sure that the arbitra arbitrator has experience and is very conversant in that sector. And this is more important if you have very specialized disputes. So if you had a complex construction and engineering dispute, you want to appoint a some, someone who is an expert in construction and engineering. Because we perform uh, the scrutiny of the award, uh, we are also able to really understand how arbitrators are able to marshal cases. So their past experience, overall reputation, uh, familiarity uh, with the applicable laws. One of the interesting things about arbitration is you can have a maze of different laws that are at play. So you could have a, a Sao Paulo seat of arbitration, you could have Singapore law governing the contract, and then maybe Canadian law governing the arbitration agreement. So we want to make sure that we have an arbitrator that is familiar with those laws. One of the, an easy proxy that we use when we're appointing arbitrators, because SIC gets cases that are both governed by com or common law and civil law. So it's sometimes if it was a civil law case, we might start by looking at civil law uh, arbitrators. But of course, you have arbitrators qualified in hybrid systems uh, as well. One of the interesting situations that we come, up, come upon is in the case of a multi-party appointment. So we're all familiar with the case in .co, and this is important because a multi-party situation can be created when, it, when you have consolidation. So if you had a string of five, five contracts, claimant, single claimant uh, and respondent in each contract, because under the SIC consolidation rules, we don't require identity of the parties, so there might be different parties. If these are consolidated prior to the constitution of the tribunal, you will now potentially have multiple claimants and multiple respondents. Now, the maxim set out in DUTCO is that if you don't get joint nominations on both sides, that all parties will lose their right to appoint and the institution will appoint all three arbitrators. But what you're really looking for in a multi-party situation, and this is where you want the institution to exercise some discretion, is when the parties are adverse to each other. So if you had, say, uh, a shell company on the respondent side that had not joined in on the nomination with the other respondent, this may be a situation where you want to preserve uh, the nomination of one of the respondents rather than appointing all three arbitrators. Under the SIC rules and SIC's over, overall philosophy is that party autonomy does govern so parties are able to come to their own arrangements on how they want to make an appointment. And this default position under the SIC rules that the institution appoints the third and presiding arbitrator, this can be quite easily varied by the institution. So say similar to the position under the institutional rules, if the parties want to provide in their arbitration clause that the co-arbitrators are to nominate the third and presiding arbitrator, this is perfectly possible and we often see this. We're seeing more and more cases where parties are adopting a list procedure, so strike and rank, whereby they will ask the parties to furnish a list of five or more arbitrators to each side. Each side will then rank and return those lists in the order of preference. Uh, I've said publicly a few times, I've seen a lot of different arrangements that parties have come to, including coin flips, where the parties had come to two, two possible sole arbitrators but weren't able to decide. So they had decided on a coin flip as the way to decide. So we're going. what we're going to do uh, is that we're going to look at the agreement of the parties, always trying to give effect to the agreement of the parties, any, any agreed qualifications, and then we'll read those through the lens of the SIC rules. We have an SIC panel of arbitrators. Uh, I actually see one of our Brazilian members of the SIC panel of arbitrators has joined us uh, today. So we have more than 500 uh, arbitrators from more than 40 jurisdictions uh, on our public panel of arbitrators. The, this is a, a list of the best arbitrators in the world that have all been vetted and selected by the SIC Court of Arbitration. But importantly, the SIC panel is an open panel. So a party in an SIC arbitrator can nominate any arbitrator of their choice subject to confirmation by the president. But in many cases, the parties will choose to nominate an arbitrator from the SIC panel of arbitrators. We also have a reserve panel of arbitrators. This is a non-published list, and this is designed for uh, 
there are arbitrators of uh, arbitration council of standing that may not have that many arbit arbitration appointments to date. And we've had really good success with this SIC reserve panel. We appoint from it quite often. This is useful for keeping costs down in relatively small value cases and also developing the next generation uh, of arbitrators who will eventually graduate to the SIC panel. And I think in any conversation about appointments, it's important to talk about diversity in arbitrator uh, appointments. And this is something that we're very intentional about at SIC. So we want to appoint arbitrators with diverse characteristics, both visible and non-visible diverse characteristics, sometimes the intersection of those characteristics as well. So we're looking at gender diversity in 2020. One third of the appointments made by the institution were female arbitrators. We're also looking at geographic diversity. We SIAC has had parties from more than 100 jurisdictions in the last five years. What, where, what we eventually want to achieve is we want the appointment of the arbitrators in SIC cases to match our very diverse user base. And we're also looking at generational diversity. We've had very good success appointing younger arbitrators, younger arbitrators that are precocious arbitration counsel, again, in a relatively small value case, can be very effective. We also have very senior arbitrators. I think the range of our arbitrators currently sitting in SIC arbitrations is probably from 29 years old to 90 years old. And as I mentioned, because everything is operating virtually, we are able to appoint arbitrators from all around the world. So really our job at the secretary when we're making recommendations to the president and the vice president is that we wanna find the best arbitrators in the world wherever they are in the world, whether it's Sao Paulo, uh, Vancouver, Tokyo, uh, or Jakarta. Thank you. Uh, and now I move to, to Karina to speak a little bit uh, on uh, arbitrator disclosure and, and partiality because that's a big issue in, in my experience in domestic arbitrations, arbitration with CITOP in Brazil compared to international arbitrations. Uh, we in Brazil tend to challenge more the arbitrators and we are more picky on the arbitrators than elsewhere. So I'd like to hear uh, Karina expense as a Brazilian a practitioner and as a member of the SIAC for. Thank you, Joaquin. So indeed, it is a hot topic in Brazil, and mostly because we have had in the past years such a pro-arbitration approach from our superior courts. Um, the, the possibilities to annul an arbitral award in Brazil are very, very strict. Um, so the, the discussions that we saw most recently are much more in regard to impartiality and dependence of arbitrators rather than um, challenge, whether than discussions to a NOAA award based, based on jurisdiction matters, for example. And uh, it is true that our arbitration act, just like in many other jurisdictions, provide, provides that um, arbitrators must be independent and impartial. It also provides that arbitrators um, have the duty to disclose information that um, could be uh, could raise to third parties a justifiable doubt uh, about the impartiality, about his ability to rule the merits of the case simply based on, 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 on the information of the case and not being affected or impacted by any circumstances um, that would uh, raise issues of conflict of interest. So our uh, arbitration act is broad. Um, other institutions, uh, most of the institutions have provisions on that. So SIAC do have uh, uh, rules on in the provisions on the rules um, that says that an arbitrator shall immediately disclose to parties to 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 the other arbitrators and to the secretariat any circumstances that may give rise to justifiable doubts to his impartiality. Here there is a difference uh, with the ICC rules. The ICC rules. Uh, mentions that it should be on the eyes of the parties 
which um, gives a little bit of subjective uh, understanding here. So which would be uh, the eyes of the parties, which, which would be uh, the circumstances that the parties feel comfortable or not. So I, I prefer this approach. And this is also the approach that um, the IBA rules on conflict of interest adopt. So because um, the parties wanted more, uh, uh, more parameters, um, to in which they could uh, understand what situations could raise doubts about justifiable doubts and just, justifiable is an important word because the parties cannot as happens uh, most of the time in some cases in Brazil cannot expect that arbitrators would disclose anything any situation any circumstances that are actually irrelevant for the case for his um, performance in the case um, that he would do a, a research in, in his past, uh, in his firm, if he, he works mostly for a, a big firm as well, um, that could uh, simply um, erase any situation, any situation uh, that would link the arbitrator to to one of the councils, to one of the parties. That was the, that, that's why uh, international community has decided uh, to has discussed it a lot. Um, institutions have created notes of conduct on conflict of interest, and and the IBA rules became uh, a very uh, important guideline that is adopted even by by Brazilian courts currently, um, as at least as a, a guideline on which situations would would. Uh, bring some concern so the arbitrators should disclose um for example and and this list has uh, red flags in situations that really could uh, on the eyes of a third party uh bring reasonable doubts on whether the arbitrator would be merely focused on the merits of the case and not be impacted by any situation out, outside of it or uh orange flags situations that uh, if arbitrators know, they should disclose. But the important thing here is that um, we need to find the calibration, right? The, the, the calibration between um, a duty to disclose information that is relevant and um, uh, the, the protection of the institution. So if, if we put, impose a duty on the arbitrations to disclose everything, every even irrelevant things, uh, um, it may be a way for uh, parties that are not in good faith to raise objections all the time, to create uh, issues, to, to, to file challenges that could um, delay the proceedings, that could uh, stop the proceedings. And, and that's, why, that's why I think that uh, the courts um, in, in, in SIAC and even in other institutions have been very careful in the international uh, in the international world uh, have been very careful on applying those parameters um, not to create uh, uh, excuses for challenges that in the end uh, are, are not are unfound are, are not grounded and just um, put in danger the institution, the, the arbitration as itself. So um, also it is very important, the matter of timing, right? So if the parties get to know about something that um, should be disclosed by arbitration, they should raise immediately. Um, the parties should not hold this information and, and this discussion that we have with our clients a lot, with in-house counsel a lot, you should never hold an information um, that you would use after the award is rendered. Um, and if, if this situation happens, if the counterparty uh, files a lawsuit uh, to annul the proceeding um, based on, on an information that it, it could have known, um, the arbitrator, the arbitrator, maybe has not disclosed, but it's it's such a relevant. It, it is irrelevant for the arbitrator. It's public information. It is there. The parties could have known, or the parties do know. You can prove that the parties actually knew that circumstances. So this could never be accepted as a, a, a reasoning to challenge to to try to annul an award afterwards. 
And I think that this is a, a current uh, concern, both of uh, uh, arbitra uh, arbitration practitioners of uh, in-house counsel, because they, they keep asking us uh, which type of information we should ask in the beginning of the proceeding, for example. Uh, the parties, uh, when, when they got the appointment, they could send questions to the arbitrators asking for further information, do their own homework to be sure that um, the procedure will follow its path from there uh, without a future challenge or without a, a surprise challenge in the end of uh, after the award is rendered. Mm -hmm. uh, Karina, uh, another thing you provide a little bit, but uh, spoke very well, so, uh, something else came to, to, to my mind. Uh, what about availability? That's uh, another big issue in Brazil. They're criticizing arbitrators for not being available, taking too many cases. I want to hear you and then Kevin, what could be done to, to avoid those, those, those issues, like arbitrators undertaking to be available at the end of the day, they are not. Yeah, and this is also an issue that our our in-house uh, colleagues uh, and clients uh, bring to us all the time, right? The Brazilian community is, in the end, we have so many cases, arbitration cases in Brazil currently that the Brazilian community, community became small. So uh, arbitrators with experience in Brazil are limited. <laughs> you, it's hard to find. So, and that's why it's so important to have uh, access um, to SIC, to international uh, arbitrators that do speak Portuguese, that can handle cases virtually. And so we open also a little bit our, um, our options and, and get people available. And this will just uh, enrich uh, the, the the community right because then uh, 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 arbitrators have more time to deal with their cases they also get to have experience with uh, 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 arbitrators from from the international community that have experience in, in different cases commercial cases as well so um, uh, it is a, an important matter one of the uh, questions that are usually done and as I see uh, Kevin can can speak more more about this but as i said does uh, check with arbitrators their availability um it, you can even ask how many cases they are handling at the time um but uh, and the parties can can uh, object or or show their concern before um, the confirmation of the arbitrator uh, to the panel that uh, the arbitrator would be uh too busy um, and, and the arbitrator should compromise that they would give the information about their uh, availability. Yeah, thanks. Kevin, is that as a big issue uh, worldwide as it became in, in Brazil? Like the availability, yeah. the fact that they, some arbitrators take too many cases and, mm. and they don't deliver and, and take too much time to issue some decisions. That's a common complaint that we heard about the client. Like they ask for a certain decision and they take three weeks, four months because the, the arbitrators are too busy. And how, what could uh, the institution do to, to avoid this, the, this kind of situation? Yeah, it's a, that, this is a big deal in arbitration and something that was happening. I noticed it more about 10 years ago where in a very small percentage of cases, you might have an arbitrator that would take a year after the close of proceedings to render the award. And institutional arbitration now is so competitive. This is just not something that is tolerated at SIC. And the very quick answer for an arbitrator who has too many cases and is not able to conduct uh, a case efficiently, efficiently, they likely will not be appointed anymore. Now, but this is the point that Karina touched on with disclosure is important because there are issues of availability are something that will be put to the parties. So right now, if you had an arbitrator, say in a case conducted under the expedited procedure where the award has to be rendered in six months and the arbitrator accepts the prospective appointment and says that I am available and able to act, although I should disclose that I'm in hearings for the entire months of January and February. We would then put this to the parties for comments. Both sides may say, no, we need a different arbitrator. This arbitrator does not have the capacity or one side 
may object. And then the appointing authority uh, in its discretion would then decide whether to proceed with the appointment. Now it's a bit trickier when you're looking at an institutional appointment versus a party nominated arbitrator. And how is the institution going to deal with that? And the same way that we want our users to have confidence in us, we also want arbitrators to have confidence in us and how we're able to deal with disclosures. We want arbitrators to be able to make full and frank disclosure and be confident that the institution will be treating it appropriately. And then I guess at the tail end of an arbitration, any sort of delay will have consequences on the arbitrator's fees. These arbitrator's fees will be taxed. And what's important from an institutional standpoint, under the SIC rules, the award has to be submitted to the Secretariat for scrutiny 45 days from the close of proceedings. Now, we all know that the old arbitrator trick is just to delay the close of proceedings until they're almost finished drafting the award. So as a matter of practice, we have more than a thousand active cases. Every SIC council, once the evidential hearing is complete, if there's post hearing submissions, the job of the institution is to prompt the tribunal to close the proceedings so we can get that 45 day period for them to submit the draft award uh, started. So we, we have not had an issue with arbitrators uh, taking on too many cases because of our disclosure requirements. And just the fact that given our priority on expedition, it's just not something that we accept in SIC arbitrations. That, that, that's very interesting. Uh, so uh, then I move to uh, another issue that uh, it's pretty much uh, discussed is the expedited uh, procedure because the main problem of non-available uh, arbitrator is that it takes too long and the parties more and more try to uh, to get to, to expedited uh, procedures because it reduces costs and make the arbitration go, uh, goes quicker. So I want to hear about Flavio, from Flavio, his experience with expedited procedure and what, whether it's, it's a good choice for, for the parties. Because in theory, yes, but sometimes we have some kind of butterfly in our body to, to go to when you choose an expedited procedure because you won't be able to make uh, as much evidence as in a normal procedure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Joaquin. And thank you. I'd like to thank SIAC for the invitation and Karina and, and you, Joaquin, as well. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, yes. Um, well, expedited procedure is something that, uh, well, I personally find very attractive in, in any kind of rules. I think it's, it's important to have that feature available to the parties. I think that, I mean, if we look at the Brazilian market, uh, the time, the length of the, of the procedure is not something uh, uh, that a formal arbitration would be a problem. If you go to courts, you take much longer than, let's say a regular uh, 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 arbitration uh, procedure. The, the issue is um, that sometimes you have you need to go even faster, and costs. So there is a, a, a perhaps a, a issue that comes uh, often to clients' mind, whereas well, I have I, I I want to go to arbitration, but you know the amount in disputes is not so high. So if I follow all the procedure, it's going to be a very long procedure, and I'm going to spend a lot of money. So I mean, is that is arbitration the 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 good choice? And as you uh, you you brilliantly put out, uh, Joaquin, uh, I think arbitration is definitely the good choice. And having the expedited procedure uh, makes this easier. And 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 in this case, in, under the SIAC rules, uh, also addresses your point of the butterflies in the belly. And I'll get to that. I think that first. Um, what I, what I want to highlight is that it, it's up to the parties to actually uh, request. So prior to the constitution of the tribunal, any party can request and, and file an application with the registrar to, to make the procedure uh, follow an expedited uh, pr uh, uh, manner. Uh, and as Adriana point out, uh, the amount of dispute should not, cannot exceed uh, six million Singapore do uh, dollars, which is 4.5, right, Adriana, millions uh, US dollars. So that's the aggregate amount of the disputes, claims, counterclaims. If you have that, 
and the parties have agreed to uh, uh, in, in the arbitration clause or, or afterwards to go uh, to that route, you can any party can make that 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 request. Uh, another option, as Adriana highlighted in, in the beginning, is exceptional urgency. So in exceptional cases, uh, the, 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 uh, the court, the president, they can analyze and understand that, of course, upon a file of application and hearing the other party, they can decide that uh, going with the expedited procedure is, is um, important. And, and when there is a determination that the expedited procedure, so it's going to be applied, there are some things that will change in the procedure. So first, uh, um, all the time limits that are provided under the rules can be uh, uh, abbreviated. And, and it that's, uh, relies upon the registrar to do so in a manner that the, 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 the case can end and have an award issue within six months from the date that the tribunal is, uh, was constituted. So second, normally is gonna be a sole arbitrator, unless the president can determine otherwise, but as, as a general uh, uh, faster way to go, it would be a sole arbitrator. And as you said, Joaquin, the issue of, of, the, of uh, evidence uh, is also provided in the rules, which means that uh, uh, in consultation with the parties, and then it relies on, on the tribunal, it may decide the dispute to, to be decided only on uh, documentary evidence. So it's, it's upon to the tribunal actually to decide whether you need uh, a, a expert witness hearings, but of course there is a, a, a tendency that it should be uh, a, a, a less complex case due to the amount. And then uh, it, it, the, 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 there is this possibility that the case can be decided only based on documentary evidence. Um, but, uh, but one thing that I found uh, very interesting about uh, uh, the rules is that during the procedure, uh, it's possible to actually decide not to go to the expedited procedure. So let's say that you, the, the parties requested to go to expedited procedure, was decided to be expedited procedure, but then it became more complex. It became, for some reason, uh, um, there is an understanding that the case should follow uh, a regular uh, uh, procedure. Then any party can request, of course, the other party will, will be heard. And then the tribunal may decide to, and, 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 and of course, uh, uh, making a consultation with the registrar as well, may order that the proceeding is no longer conducted in accordance with the decided procedure. So then, of course, it, uh, it's not gonna have to end issue an award within six months. Then you, you, you won't have to worry about um, the tribunal deciding to have your case decided only um, by document, if that is something to be worried about. Uh, so in summary, I think that this kind of feature and, and taking what Kevin said in the beginning it is something that is very attractive to, 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 to clients. And you, you, you have a rule that is flexible. It can change during, um, as the case may be, uh, you have, uh, you, of course, you have opportunity to present your case. Uh, it's documentary if you need a hearing or not. And, and, and also addresses the issue of a smaller, let's say, uh, uh, amount case. Um, so, uh, and, and, and makes the decision faster. So I think this is something that, um, I mean, to my experience, um, sometimes it's not very attractive to lawyers that have to work very fast, but to clients, definitely it is something to, to, um, um, to use. And 
in Brazil, it particularly, where you have this issue about you know arbitration being very costly compared to court, but then court being very uh, time consuming compared to arbitration. Having the expedited procedure addresses both things. It's faster. Uh, it's going to be uh, much cheaper because it's a smaller amount, and Adriana will talk about that. But uh, addresses both issues and, and, you, and you're safe to have a final arbitral award, as you said, Joaquin, that can be enforced anywhere in the world. So I think that's, that's my, my comments. And, and as I said, I think it's, it's, it's very, uh, I invite everyone that hasn't read those rules to read it because it, it, it's very good. Thank you, Flavio. I'll go a little bit off uh, script because something that is said uh, brought my attention. Uh, it's very interesting that you can, uh, the arbitrators may change, like get this for that procedure and then shift to another procedure depending on, on the particularities of, of the case to preserve the, the procedure and to avoid a, a future challenge. So uh, I don't know if Kevin or Adriana uh, have any feeling whether or not you have more challenges, more applications to set aside award in, in expedited procedures than in uh, normal procedures, or if it's the same. Because if, the, if it is the same, I think something is working well. Do, do you have yeah. this, this idea? Uh, well, in, in terms of the provision whereby uh... On application of a party, a tribunal can decide to or take the case off the expedited procedure. What you have to be cognizant of is whether or not the arbitral procedure is in accordance with the agreement of the parties from a New York convention standpoint. And so there's two ways the institution or the tribunal can deal with this. On the one hand, the, the time can be extended in exceptional circumstances. So the registrar can decide to extend the time or otherwise the case can be taken off uh, the expedited procedure. The reason why we quite intentionally uh, required the tribunal to consult with the registrar is we didn't want a tribunal to be taking it off the expedited procedure solely because they were unable to render the award. Now, we've had very few challenges from a, a procedure standpoint. Uh, there are three now quite seminal cases on the president's authority to appoint a sole arbitrator even when the arbitration clause provides for a three-member tribunal. So you have two positive judgments from Singapore in BCY uh, and uh, BCZ and BXS and BXT that say the president does indeed have this authority. And then you, the Shanghai Intermediate Court in a case called Noble Resources uh, said that it did not, but the facts were relatively specific. And we have had cases where the arbitration clause provided for a three-member tribunal president appointed a sole arbitrator. One of those was enforced in China in Ningbo. So from a procedure standpoint, uh, we have not had many applications to set aside an award based on uh, the procedure going long. But this is uh, right now, uh, UNSATROL Working Group 2 is looking at the fast track procedure for the UNSATROL rules. And this has been kind of a thorny issue because how is expedited procedure going to work in the ad hoc context? But from an institutional standpoint, because we're there and we can monitor uh, the procedure, we haven't had many issues with timelines. And the very few cases where it has been taken off the expedited procedure, it has been based on parties agreement where the case has become wholly unsuitable. A case that was originally, say, 3 million USD uh, has become very complex and very high value. And both parties have agreed that this is no longer a fast track case. Uh, uh, I'll shift to another subject that's also very hot, that's the uh, need to foster mediation. Uh, I'll start with the, the more generic legal development, that's the uh, new international uh, treaty on mediation, that's the Singapore treaty. It's <laughs> supposed to be the New York Convention uh, on mediation, we have the Singapore uh, Convention. Uh, so, Adriana, if you could uh, explain a little bit to, uh, to, to the audience this new convention that, uh, uh, if not mistaken, Brazil has signed the, uh, the convention and now trying to, to, pass, uh, to ratify it in the Congress. 
and if you also could describe the work of your uh, sister institution, the Singapore International Mediation Center. Right. Um, thanks, Joachim. So you're right about this new treaty. It, it came out, I think, a few years ago. It was held in, in Singapore. Um, they named it after Singapore, the Singapore Mediation um, Convention. And what it does, it operates basically like a New York Convention to Arbitration, that is to mediation. So what, that's, what that convention does is that it makes um, mediated se settlement um, enforceable in jurisdictions where parties have agreed to do so. So um, there are uh, a number of countries that have um, signed and ratified the convention, Singapore being one of it, and I think Brazil is also part of it. Um, of course, um, we just held a um, our, uh, mediation week in, in Singapore recently. Our sister um, institution, Singapore International Mediation Center has been um, really promoting this convention as well as part of the suites of dispute resolution offered um, in Singapore. And um, SIC is also fully supportive of, of this convention being that it's, it's one of the viable dispute resolution process that parties um, may consider when, um, when deciding in their contract. Okay. And uh, you have a... Uh, uh... Even before, if I'm not mistaken, even before the, the convention, SIAC uh, uh, had this protocol with the Singapore International Mediation Center that's very interesting. And I think it is an example to be copied by other institutions. So, Karina, could you explain to the audience this protocol? Yes, I, I, I'm also a very enthusiastic um, with uh, enthusiastic uh, person with mediation, and and I was uh, amazed to see this uh, alternative uh, approach um, that is very efficient. And and here we have uh, uh, an audience that that this issue comes across every time when uh, you have uh, a dispute with a counterparty that is still a, a commercial partner, right? So you have an issue, you have to uh, commence an arbitration to solve a dispute, but uh, the parties are still on ongoing uh, relationships, but they cannot solve uh, that problem. And this may have an impact in, in ongoing commercial relationships. So it, it is not interesting to anyone. Mediation, uh, it is likely the way to, the way the most efficient way to solve the dispute um, but then comes a, a number of issues on well, whether uh, the parties uh, are uh, in that appropriate timing are interested in in go in choosing mediation um, whether uh, they would be able to enforce the settlement afterwards so this protocol is uh, uh, amazing because it gives uh, it uh, it actually gives an alternative that the, the users were looking for. I saw that the Queen Mary um, International Arbitration Survey of 2021 um, had as a result that 60% of the users thinks that the most appropriate way to solve their dispute is arbitration, mediation, and arbitration, which, which is exactly this, uh, the way that this protocol works. So the parties um, would have a clause, and in the website of SIAC, there is the, the module clause for that, but the parties could opt uh, also uh, through, uh, they could consent on that if they, they don't have a contractual clause already establishing that. And they could opt um, to go to SIAC and to commence arbitration. So they would file their claims, the request for arbitration response. Then uh, the, the institution would move to um, the mediation proceeding. And after, if the parties reach the settlement through the mediation proceedings, um, then the arbitral tribunal would render a consent award, or as, as we may say in Brazil, like a, an award to homologate the settlement, to ratify the settlement. And you could 
use this um, as a, 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 an award that could be enforced anywhere in Brazil or anywhere uh, as elsewhere. There is uh, countries that are parts of the New York Convention. So it is very much efficient because you uh, kind of uh, impose the parties to uh, go to mediation while they are in the, in, in the arbitration proceeding and they go through the mediation path. Uh, and in the end, they can also assure that they will have uh, an award to be enforceable. I really think that, and, and uh, I was surprised with the uh, 60% of results that would uh, like uh, to have a combination of alternative dispute resolution together with arbitration. And I think that SIC uh, came first uh, in, in providing for this, this protocol. That would be mm. a very good solution for, for clients. I think okay. it's kind of a revolution. Oh, go ahead, Adriana. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, I, I I was just reminded, and also, if I may add, and I think that our sister um, institution, the Singapore International Mediation Center, would be better suited to to explain this further. But um, in addition to the AMA protocol that we have with them, and in light of the Singapore Mediation Convention, and because of the COVID-19 pandemic, what SIMC has also done is to make it more economical um, ec and expedited for the parties to have mediation in their center. I understand that they have this online case filing um, system. They organize the mediation in 10 days, so it, it moves quite quickly. And because it's online, it doesn't require any travel time. Um, I think in, in the first few months of the pandemic, people were hesitant to have the mediation online because a lot of like um, in-person uh, um, relationship or discussion is um, important in mediations. But it, it seems to have been working. They have been um, getting more cases, especially during the pandemic. They've extended special rates for um, SIMC and mediators, and, and they have also capped mediation fees like with arbitration. So in, in certain mediation cases, normally it would be a per hour rate um, charge for mediators, but what they've done is they've capped um, their fees. And, and what the SIMC does is that they match the disputes with, with their experienced mediators. So they also have a panel of um, medi mediators and that they also provide online support through their SIMC secretariat. So, I mean, I, I anyone who's um, interested in mediation as well as a form of um, dispute settlement, I invite them to visit our sister institutions outside the Singapore International Mediation Center. And I'm so sorry, Joachim, I, I interrupted you um, back there. So go ahead. No, no the, the, thank you for the, this very valuable clarification. I was about to say that that's a revolution because in, in our experience, like they're trying to, Foster mediation in Brazil for many years, like uh, it started as a resolution of the uh, Council of, of Justice in Brazil. We did a mediation law. Uh, it's getting uh, better, but it still has not come to a tipping point. But when we, uh, we see more medi uh, meaningful mediation are in the med arb uh, clauses, when we have an arbitration clause with a free uh, mediation clause and this protocol, in my view, creates an implied met up clause. But it's even better because at any point in time, the arbitrators could send the case to, to mediation and they are mature uh, to be mediated. When you have this met up clause, sometimes at the beginning, it's not the best, uh, the best moment. Uh, here uh, in, in this protocol, the arbitrators could like feel the temperature of the water and sent to mediation at a, a lower cost because if I understood like you waive some of the uh, of the fees because of the, uh, sister uh, entities uh, that it would, it would be quite helpful if the domestic Brazilian traders uh, set up uh, protocols like you have. You know, talking about domestic international case, uh, I want to hear a little bit from uh, Kevin about uh, choosing the seat of arbitration, the importance of the, uh, of the seat for the SIAC uh, cases, especially because uh, we f when we think about SIAC, we think about arbitration in, in Asia, but I think you are much more international and the cases are more 
I think that's controversial, but I use the expression, are more delocalized than people would think. Yeah, and I mean, it, all, it almost goes to a discussion on drafting arbitration clauses uh, and the importance of, of the seat clearly setting out uh, the seat if you want to specify the venue, which to me is generally too prescriptive, so you don't want to at the drafting stage governing law. All of these are very important. And Singapore has really advanced as a seat, seat of arbitration, according to the Queen Mary, Mary University of London White and K survey. Singapore and London are now tied for the most preferred seats of arbitration in the world. And there's a lot of reasons uh, for that. And uh, Singapore as a destination for disputes is bigger than just arbitration and it's bigger than just SIC. So we we're talking about the Singapore International Mediation Center. If you look at Singapore, Singapore may have more institutions administering cases out of Singapore. So SIC, ICC, WIPO, ICDR, Permanent Court of Arbitration, Singapore Chamber of Maritime Arbitration, are all in Singapore administering cases out of there. But to me, the more exciting part, and particularly for Brazilian parties, is the fact that the seat of arbitration is delocalized. So there's no default presumption that when you're selecting SIC arbitration, that you have to have Singapore as a seat. So Singapore is a great seat, but you can have Sao Paulo, Rio, uh, Miami, New York, Houston, any seat that the parties want to choose in an SIC arbitration uh, is, is no problem. Same thing for the law applying to the contract. Uh, when we imagine that we're going to be back having physical in-person hearings, those hearings can also uh, be in Brazil uh, or, or New York. Of course, Adriana is now the, the head of SIC Americas. We will have a bricks and mortar presence uh, in New York. So we anticipate that lots of parties are going to have New York as a seat and New York as uh, a hearing venue. So this is, this is the advantage uh, of SIC arbitration and arbitration generally. An SIC arbitration could feel very Brazilian. You could have the seat in Brazil. You could have an all Brazilian panel of arbitrators, Brazilian law applying to the substance of the dispute. And you're getting the 24 hour uh, case, manage, case management of SIC, but no one ever has to go to Singapore. And then of course you have Adriana uh, based in New York along with uh, Lucy Reed, uh, based in New York as well. Okay. Uh, and Karina, what's your view on, uh, because our clients in, in, in Brazil are pretty much concerned about the seat and having an arbitration uh, in interna international arbitration. What are the consequences? What would be, what would be your comments on, on the seat and the legal consequences for the parties in Brazil? So as I, as, as I was listening to Karen, that was exactly the, the first questions that our clients raised, right? So uh, why would we use uh, SIAC um, for even international case, but uh, based in Brazil, if you want to keep the seat in Brazil, and that's exactly the point here, you can choose uh, to, your case to be administered by SIAC, and have Brazil, São Paulo as a seat. São Paulo uh, and Rio currently have um, a, a, a judiciary that uh, supports arbitration. Uh, since uh, since the since Brazil ratified the New York Convention um, uh, in the 90s, uh, the Brazilian Superior Court wanted to make sure that Brazil um, would be a pro-arbitration uh, place, a safe place uh, to enforce arbitral awards. Um, and this has been uh, how the jurisprudence developed. So um, it is currently settled among courts, among Brazilian courts, that uh, the arbitral tribunal will decide on its own jurisdiction. So, and this will be protected, this will be uh, preserved. And only after the award is rendered, if the party wants to, if there is ground, if there are grounds for that, and if the parties want to challenge the jurisdiction, they would do through uh, an action to set, to set aside the award. But the, the, the jurisprudence has protected the institution and uh, confirming that uh, the arbitral tribunal is the one that will say that will decide on its own jurisdiction. So if you have an arbitration clause, the institution sees that the arbitration clause exists, it's valid, uh, it submits, for example, another, uh, in the case of SIAC, 
an objection, uh, the court will uh, render a, a, a decision prima facie confirming that the arbitration can move forward. Brazilian courts will not stop it, um, at least in the most majority of the cases and the jurisprudence that has been uh, pacified in our superior courts. So Brazil, it's a safe place for arbitration, um, even uh, foreign uh, parties that enter into agreement with Brazilian parties um, feel comfortable or ha as having the seat of arbitration uh, in Brazil. The courts will not interfere in the procedure. The courts will be supportive. For, for example, if the parties do not wish to go to um, uh, address for injunction through emergency arbitrators, they could go to courts before um, the procedure move, moves, moves forward, but that's all. And then afterwards, even like enforcement of, um, uh, of uh, a foreign award in Brazil um, would go through a process of ratification um, that would have some grounds to be accepted. For example, um, uh, there would be a, a, a verification on whether the, the award, the foreign award, is not against a Brazilian public policy. Um, and this is always a tricky issue. If the arbitration has Brazil as the seat, then uh, the award will be a domestic, will be can be enforced here in Brazil, and and the the um, the issues that the party could raise to annul the award are even more restrictive than uh, enforcing a foreign award under the New York Convention. For example, there is no possibility to annul an award based on the argument that is against public policy. So there are, there are a number of uh, currently there are we we are happy to say that there are a number of. Uh, of advantages for Brazilian parties to keep the seat in Brazil, especially in Sao Paulo and Rio, where you have specialized commercial courts, um, specialized in um, arbitration, meaning in how to enforce, how to decide uh, injunction matters, and also how to decide on annulment actions um, in a very pro-arbitration manner. I saw that there was a, a question in the chat, Joaquin. I don't know if you are familiar with that case. Uh, um, there was perhaps the panel could consider uh, the renowned case in England, uh, Sul America uh, against Inesa. And as far as I remember, I was, I was not involved in that case, but as far as I remember, there was a discussion on which would be the applicable law because the seat of the arbitration was London. Um, it was a LC, uh, um, okay. London Court of International, or CIA um, case. And in the end, there was a huge discussion on if, uh, it, because there were, I think, also multi-party and uh, different agreements in that case. but. Uh, I remember that there was an anti-injunction from uh, the arbitration panel before the LCIA, for, so nobody could go to Brazilian courts to stop the proceeding, the arbitration proceeding. But there was also an injunction <laughs> from Brazilian court that uh, the arbitral tribunal um, didn't have jurisdiction. So it, it created a, a very complicated um, scenario. I'm sure. Uh, I'd, uh, um, I don't know uh, the specifics of the case, just see how, if it was administered by SIAC, what would have been done, both by the Secretariat considering the rules, um, maybe to solve the, the jurisdiction issue right in the beginning, um, or uh, after once the panel was, once the tribunal was constituted, uh, of course the tribunal would be able to revise. And I'm sure that um, if Singapore was the seat of the arbitration, um, they, they would enforce also the jurisdiction of their, the decision on, of the arbitral tribunal on jurisdiction. And, and Brazil um, would also favor the jurisdiction of the arbitral tribunal, the decision of the arbitral tribunal on jurisdiction. So that would be um, the decision that should prevail. That's, that's yeah. what I, I, I would say about this case. I see here that the case also included a ruling by English courts that the step clause, including mediation as first step was invalid because the clause did not explicitly state that uh, pre-arbitral mediation was required. Okay. Yeah. So the parties were not obliged to, uh, to uh, first uh, go uh, to uh, mediation. 
Yeah, if I may, I, I, uh, yes, Karina, I think that case it was prior to our mediation law as well, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. Okay. Just, yeah, just but... for everybody to know, uh, I mean, in 2015, uh, our mediation law uh, created a provision where if the parties decided to go first to mediation prior to arbitration, the parties have, they, they need to try at least one hearing and before they, they can commence arbitra arbitration or the arbitration will be suspended, the parties will have to try at least. And before that, there wasn't that provision. So I think that maybe that's why there was this ruling at the time. Not sure, just yeah, yeah. <laughs> thinking out yeah, loud yeah. here and sharing. Yeah, I also thinking out loud that uh, like the remedy under Brazilian law would be to suspend the arbitration until the mediation. So uh, I don't think uh, Paul, uh, our good friend Paul Mays uh, is doing the, uh, the comment. Thank you both for attending. Uh, I think now under Brazilian law, I have to spend because it's crystal clear in the law. And I think the comment on this, the SIAC rules is about the delocalization. And sorry for using the term because it, the term is quite controversial, but it's not. The SIAC does not give that much uh, bearing on the seat of arbitration as like LCIA. If I'm, uh, it was a question from yeah. YK Chan. I think that uh, there will be. I think that's what's behind the question. Like if you have a, 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 an institution like SIAC uh, that does not give that much importance for the, for the seat, that would avoid the problems that uh, people had in the Sul America case where they chose LCIA that's quite, that gives an opposite approach and not criticizing the competitor, but I'm saying that they give <laughs> some weight to the, uh, the seat and that creates a problem when we have international arbitration with a lot of Brazilian law as a applicable law. Kevin, if you want to, to comment on that. Yeah, oh, just thanks, Joaquim. Just a, a couple observations. First of all, this is why it's good to have Karina uh, on the SIC court. So if there's any quest question of the existence or validity of an arbitration agreement at the prima facie stage. And it also underscores uh, knowing the applicable laws and your choice of the seat of arbitration, particularly with these pre-arbitral steps and whether or not there's been compliance with the pre-arbitral arbitral steps. So if you've contracted, say, for 30 days of structured negotiation, are you going to be required to fulfill those uh, before you can commence arbitration? And you may end up getting against uh, a limitation period as well. Uh, the position in Singapore following a case called Lufthansa is that if, if the pre-arbitral steps are specific, you are likely going to be bound uh, to that bargain. And that's one of the reasons why I think that ARB Med ARB uh, is a really good choice in a lot of cases, because you crystallize that date of commencement, start the arbitration, get the arbitration stayed, and then get, go, get to go to mediation. If you have mediation as a pre-arbitral step, and this has been cured by the Singapore Convention, there, there is that academic question of whether or not there's a dispute. Do you get that date of the commencement properly uh, crystallized? So, uh, I, I mean, I often find my way back around to arguing in favor of ARB Med ARB because it's, it's quite low risk and, and can really help expedite cases. Yeah, it can actually solve this huge number of discussions that were raised because of this clause that imposes a, a, a negotiation and mediation through a certain period before you can file arbitration. And in most of the cases, uh, I saw decisions here in Brazil in domestic cases, whether the parties um, were not bound to um, wait for the, the period and negotiate if they have if they have already tried to negotiate and it was uh, um, it wasn't able to reach an agreement, then they would go directly to arbitration. But I fully agree that the ARB made uh, ARB solves that issue, and you can start arbitration already. I also saw that there is another question um, on whether arbitration in Brazil can only be applied only with both parties' consent. Yes, uh, so consent is a, a requirement under Brazilian law. It doesn't need to be in writing, but it needs to be. It needs to be expressed. Uh, you need to uh, to have an arbitration clause, an arbitration ag agreement, uh, following the, the New York Convention um, uh, uh, rules. 
So if one of the parties did not consent, if one of the parties can show that not even um, there was no consent, like verbally or the intention was never uh, shown to be uh, to consent to the arbitral agreement, then then uh, definitely uh, probably the, the institution, the arbitral tribunal will, will not uh, enforce their arbitration um, agreement and then uh, courts, Brazilian courts as well. Yeah, and that's why it's very good to have people like Karina at the court, because the court will decide on things like joinder. And joinder yeah. uh, at the end of the boils down to, to a discussion on consent, on implied consent, because it was not implied consent. <laughs> so there would be, not be a dispute, but normally when you have a, a issue of joinder of third parties, yeah. uh, you have a big discussion on consent and then uh, uh, and then you, you you need people knowledgeable of the law. Uh, no problems when dispute. Uh, the, there's follow up question. Problems when dispute arose, the respondent will not agree to arbitration even with the arbitration agreement. That's no longer a, a problem in Brazil because after the enactment of the arbitration law and we, we celebrated last week 25 years of the law, it's pretty clear that uh, if you are, if you have a valid arbitration agreement, you have to proceed to, to arbitration. And there, that, uh, there is what we call the negative and the positive effects of an arbitration agreement. Like the negative effects is that if you file a lawsuit, the, the judge will have to dismiss the case. And the positive effect that you can proceed with arbitration if you have a, 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 a what you call a full arbitration clause, you, you have to and if you use the standard uh, arbitration clause of SIAC, you have a full arbitration clause. Uh, you can proceed even without the, the participation of the other parties. So if someone sues me, brings an arbitration at SIAC, and I say, oh, I don't want to arbitrate anymore. If the seat is Brazil, I, 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 I'm killed there. I'm dead because uh, the arbitration will continue regardless of my absence. So yes, that, that used to be a problem. Uh, that used to be a problem until 1996, but that's no longer a problem. Yeah, and then case law has made sure that the, that this will be complied by court. So the arbitration will continue. It's up to firstly the institution and then the arbitral tribunal to say, well, that party that doesn't want, the respondent that doesn't want to participate in the arbitration, the arbitral tribunal will say, if you are a signatory party, or even if we're not, if there was implied consent, this would be a decision for the arbitral tribunal. Uh, and Brazilian courts should not interfere. Brazilian courts would even reject um, the case, would dismiss the case if the party goes to courts directly uh, trying to circumvent uh, the arbitration and the arbitral proceeding. Yeah. Uh, I'll move uh, to, to a different topic that's also very, very hot. Uh, virtual hearings uh, that that became our day-to-day -day life and, and that probably was a big boost to uh, to SIAC because they saw uh, they thought about oh that's an arbitration center where the facilities are in, in Singapore and uh, now where they are open in, in, in New York uh, but now uh, all, all the hearings that I have been doing are online even I have a hearing in December three week hearing that's supposed to be in New York and we're gonna be in, uh, all virtual. So I want to hear uh, first Flavio about his experience as a counsel in virtual hearings, if it's working, what's working, what's not working in the virtual hearings. Thank you, Joaquin. I think first I, I have to say that SIAC has been ahead of its time because there is a provision that says that the tribunal may hold hearings and meetings by any means. So. I think that already allowed, uh, you know, the tribunal to to, to decide and, and and consider different ways where to do it, and virtual hearings is, is one of the options. Um, well, uh, I think that I mean before COVID, I think uh, virtual hearings would be something very exceptional. Perhaps we, we would hear. I had the experience of hearing one witness that couldn't go, uh, that was abroad and the trip was gonna be very expensive or that person could not attend for any reason. Um, so that already existed to some extent, but of course, uh, 
counsel and arbitrators were always in the same room. And I think that now uh, it, it showed that virtual hearings is something that is totally possible. Uh, I, I understand there are some preferences, different uh, uh, ways to go, but I, I, find, I find it very, a very good options for international cases. Um, I understand there's sometimes the issue of, of time zones that sometimes is complex. Uh, I, I had a case with a, again, a Brazilian party against a Korean party, and it was tricky to find time to, to, to have a virtual hearing, uh, but, but it, it happened. So, uh, um, and, and I think that uh, as, as Kevin pointed out, uh, I think that it, it, the international, the, the fact that we can use, we are in Brazil and it can use the rules of SIAC for me, it, it, it's the same as having a hearing with anybody in the world as you, when, where you are. And, and, and by experience, I think it works very well. Um, of course, sometimes one may say, oh yeah, you can, you have some issues to know that nobody is, of course, uh, let's say tempering the witness or giving information, or uh, you have to be careful about, um, it's hard to have the feeling of the room or something like that, but you also have some benefits. For instance, uh, it's easier to be looking at the screen and looking at documents at the same time in a very, for me, very easier way, uh, communicating with the team in a very easier way that even in a, in, in, in a present location, it would be harder. Uh, um, and sometimes perhaps would not be polite <laughs> to the arbitrators to some extent. Uh, so to my view, I think, I think that is something to, and, and not to mention the cost uh, that although you may have to pay uh, uh, some provider to organize the, 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 the virtual hearing, fact is considering, uh, you know, the travel, all the travel costs involved, let's say in a week hearing, normally, you know, counsel and arbitrators, they go before, they leave after. Uh, virtual hearings is, is very much uh, cheaper. I have no doubt about it. So to my view, Joaquin, just to conclude, I think that is something that has come to, to stay to some extent. Uh, um, and and I think it's, it's sometimes it can be very, um, uh, it can work very well. I think it can be very organized. Uh, and and I've, all the hearings that I had throughout this time had gone very well. So I had no complaints uh, about it. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, and both of my head of counsel and, and uh, as a traitor I have to take some precautions. Like one, once as, as a traitor, I heard uh, like 40 witnesses in, in one uh, week, but I have a very good panel. And what like, we decided like every witness will have to depose for one, uh, for 60 minutes. We counted the time and to say like 15 minutes, 10 minutes, we have to have discipline. Otherwise it's gonna be a mess. So it's, uh, it's more challenging for the, the, the arbitrators because uh, you cannot move beyond the, uh, that time, especially because of time differences. Uh, another uh, thing that people complain in theory, but in practice does not happen that much is that, oh, someone is giving, is tipping the, the witness. Yes. Okay, but the witness, but the witness is not an actor. Yeah. Uh, a good lawyer yeah. like you and Karina, like if I, I'm tipping my witness, you're gonna realize that. And you're gonna make a question that is so difficult uh, that the witness is not going to be able to read. Like I'm speaking right now, if you make question like uh, what's the logarithm of, of 13 and not be able to see, oh, 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 oh. It, it, it's not real life. Like if the witness starts doing, doing that, everyone will, will realize that uh, the witness being tipped and lose the, the credibility. I think the, uh, the bottom line is, uh, is that uh, 
uh, uh, virtual hearings have been very helpful to save time and uh, so saving costs, especially time, because you can have uh, like small uh, hearings for procedural matter of emergency decisions in one day, two days, that would be impossible uh, to sure. do it presentially. But I'd like to hear uh, Adriana on the on SIAC's experience. Yes, thank you, Joaquin. Um, like what Flavio said, our rules, um, because it's um, quite broad in, in the powers of a, a tribunal to hear a dispute, um, we have been really encouraging um, virtual hearings, especially at the time of pandemic. Of course, we have Maxwell Chambers in Singapore. It's a world-renowned facility. A lot of people like traveling to Singapore. It's a they call first-in-class um, center to hear um, disputes. But because of the pandemic, um, things have been um, moved to the virtual space. And what we've been seeing is that while virtual hearing has all along been available to users, even before the pandemic, there is um, sort of a discomfort because people are not used to it. And so what SIC has done to assist the parties to be more comfortable and ready uh, virtually um, is that we've created uh, what we call SIC guides. And the first installment, we call, we call it taking your arbitration remote. This is a user-friendly checklist uh, to help users navigate the use of audio conference, video conference, and well, other a non-physical means of communication in their arbitration cases. Um, so I, I wanted to add to your comments about um, the concerns that parties had. So there was some getting used to the process. So in, in SIC, we've, we've been you know getting some, some stories like where witnesses were not really familiar with it. So they dial in using their mobile phone in a car. And so you, you lose all the... <laughs> formalities. And of course, there, there are issues of time zone witness coaching. So that's the good thing I think about arbitration is because it's so flexible that um, parties are able and, and institutions, tribunals are able to quickly adapt and be flexible. And that's why as soon as um, COVID hit, protocols on how to run cases um, just popped in everywhere. And, and and it's now becoming more accepted. And, and like um, Joachim just said, it's now really hard to imagine, you know, some smaller cases or even a pre-hearing conference to be um, done physically where you have to fly in arbitrators just to discuss um, the timelines, the procedures, and all of this will, can happen um, more efficiently um, and it saves parties costs. And, and to add to that, the carbon footprint as well. So we really support virtual hearings as SIC is also part of campaign for greener arbitrations. And, and this is something that can really save in terms of, um, well, the, the emissions of applying arbitrators and, and lawyers from every, all, of, all around the world. But Kevin might be able to also add to experiences on on virtual hearing, as you can see, um, these cases we 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 have our council actually sit in on these virtual hearings just to to assist. Um, and then I, I would also like to add, apart from the virtual hearing, what we've done during COVID is that we've made ourselves really accessible to the parties. Um, we've we have this live chat feature so that you can contact us anytime. Just um, it, it's on our website. So um, council, we we can address questions quite quickly. Um, we also have an internal case management system, which automates a lot of the, these procedure and allow our staff to work remotely. So our office right now is officially open three times a week to receive documents and, and transmit original copies of awards. But um, we're really taking things remote and I think it's it's been doing well. Great. Excellent. One thing that's, that's very important is to push for the parties to check the system beforehand. That, that should, people think that's a minor uh, uh, precaution, but that's very, very important to go witness by witness to see if they have internet connection, if they know how to use the, uh, the internet system. I see institutions like you that go pushing the witness, say, where are you? I have, we need to have a, a pre-hearing uh, test that makes a lot of difference because if you don't test, uh, you can end up someone uh, testifying from a car, driving a car. 
<laughs> as I said. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, and, I and, and clients should definitely like use and abuse of uh, this the infrastructure that some institutions have, like as I see, because they are available. All the questions can be resolved before, and and yes, so, and it, it it is edu like it's almost like educating users. You 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 know already how to do. You know how these virtual appearance work, how they are efficient, what we have to do to to make it happen. So. Uh, we definitely should rely on on you and your team, Adriana. Uh, one important point is uh, open a new uh, uh, subject here that's saving time and cost. That's linked to everything else that we, we discuss and at what uh, what SIAC is doing to, to save time and, and cost. And I believe that SIAC has one of the most aggressive expedited procedures. Uh, uh, compared to all the international chambers and one of the cheapest ones. I think Kevin will address that uh, in a moment. Uh, so that's a very important uh, contribution. The big trend that we see is to push parties for expedited uh, procedures that are faster and, 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 and less uh, expensive. Another uh, thing that, that's important is to push uh, the deadline, to make the uh, the arbitrators and uh, the parties comply with, with with deadlines, and I see that's a a, new, a, a cultural issue. And, and in this regard, uh, SIAC has a very positive culture. Like in, in Brazil, we have a culture uh, sometimes to do a, a timeline, but the parties start asking for extensions, or you do a timeline without including the the hearing. You do a timeline and then say, then you ask for uh, this. Uh, that's the that that comes from the Brazilian civil procedure. Like you have a deadline until the specification of evidence, and then in the specification of evidence, you ask for a lot of a hearing and you ask for a, a, an expert examination, and then you lose track of 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 the time. And one thing. Uh, that's different in, in the SIAC culture is that, uh, in my experience, you, you push to have a, a, a timeline that is really a timeline until the end of the of the, the arbitration. I think that makes a, a, a difference. And you see, you pushing the, the arbitrators to comply with the timeline, not to give uh, extension. This strong hand is very important. And uh, again, I think that's a little bit cultural. If you see the rules of the arbitration uh, institutions, they request they require the arbitrators and the parties to have detailed timelines. But in practice, people just don't follow the time <laughs> the deadlines and ask for uh, for extension. And see, you are less lenient than uh, the domestic institutions on on that kind of 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 uh, behavior. But another uh, common, uh, uh, on, on this topic on, on, on the costs, uh, in, uh, in addition to, to the expedite procedure, uh, Kevin, how do you see the costs of SIAC compared to the costs of uh, the other similar institutions or uh, the cost of domestic institutions? Sometimes you, you compete, people say, the national trade people say, oh, come to do here, at my backyard because my, at my backyard is much cheaper. Uh, Joachim, your, your, your point on culture, I think, is a very good way of describing SIC's philosophy that we are running efficient and cost-effective arbitrations. And one thing, if we talk about the choice between arbitration and litigation, I think one point that's not emphasized enough is the transnational tradition that costs follow the event. So in litigation, sometimes you will be on uh, a court schedule in terms of getting back your legal costs. But in arbitration, if you are a successful claimant and your costs claimed are reasonable, the transnational tradition is that the respondent may well be liable to reimburse you for all of your costs. So from SIC standpoint and an institutional standpoint, and this is the big difference with ad hoc arbitration, is that we are in control of the timelines. When YK Chan asked his question about uh, a party not agreeing to arbitration, this is very normal in institution, institutional arbitration. A non-participating respondent, 
an intermittently participating respondent, a respondent that may go and start court proceedings where the claimant might have to get uh, an anti-suit injunction from an emergency arbitrator. This is very typical and institutions have experience to deal with these situations that otherwise may very much extend the duration of the proceedings. The very simple formula for keeping costs down is to make arbitrations as efficient and conclude as quickly as possible. We know from the ICC cost study that if you're looking at the overall cost in an arbitration, about 20% are the institution's fees and the tribunal's fees. Institution fees, a very small amount, two or 3%, tribunal fees about 17%, and then it's the legal fees that are 80%. Now, the reason those legal fees will sometimes get very high is because the arbitration becomes uh, inefficient. Uh, timelines are extended. A respondent is able to obstruct the proceedings. You have a tribunal that's not able to properly marshal the proceedings. And that's where an institution like SIC can be very effective. Now, within that 20% for the tribunal's fees and uh, SIC's fees, at SIC, our cost system is it's based on maximum amounts. So we operate based on a schedule of fees, based on the sum and dispute. I think in my time at SIC, I've administered cases all the way from around 1,500 USD, for real, only 1,500 USD, all the way to 5 billion USD. And how we're going to treat those is quite similar. We want to make sure that the parties are only paying for the work, for the work that's actually been performed in an arbitration. From an in-house perspective, I think that's what you're looking for. You want the cost to reflect what's actually happened. So we don't worry about the amount of hours spent by an arbitrator. We're gonna make sure that we remunerate our arbitrators fairly, but we are going to look at the work performed. So from in-house at the beginning, if Karina, Joachim, or Flavio are your counsel, they are able to tell you, okay, this is your, your maximum amount for tribunal fees and institution fees. And then SIC has a cost determination process where out of that maximum amount, they're gonna fix the cost at a proportion of those maximums. So if you had a very simple case, uh, say that the tribunal or the parties agreed could be decided on the documents, no hearing required. Uh, and then it was one, relatively simple legal question, it would not be the case that automatically SIC would get 100% of these maximum amounts and the tribunal would get 100%. It would typically be a much lower proportion. So parties in SIC arbitrations will typically get refunds, even for cases that go uh, all the way to uh, a final award. And overall, the way that we're running cases and the, the drafting of our rules, it's all designed to keep costs down uh, as much as possible. Obviously, for those very high value disputes, these are going to take a bit longer. If you have a $5 billion dispute, you're not going to be able to resolve it in six months because you probably don't want to. But we just want to make sure that there's never any delay being occasioned by the institution. And we as the institution are driving the arbitrations to make sure that they're running as efficiently as possible. That's very, uh, that's very interesting. I think that the uh, as a council, uh, the big difference that I see in SIAC compared to the other institutions is, is that you are more uh, concerned about uh, timing and you have a, a best time response than the, than the average. Uh, as, as the young, I would say that you are the youngest large arbitration chamber, so you have you, yourselves the differential uh this timing you know, and that makes a, a difference that's very true one difficult thing that we have to clients and that's a section of a lot of clients is that every time uh, we do a pitch for uh, we do estimation of price compared to what's going to happen it's very difficult to, to explain to the client uh that many things could make the arbitration go off track uh, because we don't want the arbitration to, to go off track and neither the client, especially because he, he or she will pay uh, more. So that's, uh, and you see some arbitrators are very lenient on going off track because they're too busy or they, okay, you can make another round of submissions or you can make other piece of evidence because it make my uh, life easier. I have more, uh, more substance, more, uh, more things to, to decide, uh, but we need to do this cultural change and, and be uh, 
uh, and makes the the arbitrators and the parties more accountable with the timing because otherwise the arbitration will become too expensive. Uh, arbitration is a and the, uh, both arbitration and the legal service is it, it's a matter of of man uh, hours. Like of course, depending on how much man hours uh, you you need to to perform the work. So if you're not efficient, it's going to be expensive. And that's why you need this kind of uh, of, of mindset. Uh, and uh, another uh, last question goes on, on, on transparency. That's another. Uh, I'll end up with a, 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 the last hot hot topic. People uh, say that arbitration is a little bit of a gentleman's club, a country club with a very few arbitrators. Uh, that decides the case and people don't know what's being uh, decided, how the arbitrators are being appointed and what are the normal rulings. Uh, what are the measures that SIAC are taking to make arbitration more transparent? Uh, could be either for Kevin or for Adriana. I, 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 I look at, the two, there's two components here. There's transparency within the arbitral proceeding and then public transparency. So starting, starting with uh, the first transparency within the proceeding, what you want to make sure that you're doing as an institution is that you're in communication with the parties. What you really don't like as counsel or, or as a party in an arbitration is where there's institutional delay and you don't know the reason for the delay. So, and in terms of transparency, by way of example, say Karina was on a committee of the court that was deciding on whether or not a non-signatory respondent was properly a party to that arbitration. It could be the case that the SIC court committee would decide that reasons likely need to be given because the, the committee of the SIC court has found that there's not a valid and existing arbitration agreement against this non-signatory uh, respondent. This respondent said, I never signed the contract. I don't belong in this arbitration. And the SIC court may, may indeed find that they were not a part of the arbitration. In terms of public transparency, we're trying to take a very practical approach to the confidentiality of the proceedings. And confidentiality is a very big deal to parties in the Asia, in Asia Pacific in particular. Not only that, in Singapore seated arbitrations, Singapore has updated the legislation in order to further empower a tribunal to sanction parties for breaches of confidentiality. At SIC, we recognize that it's important to develop uh, arbitral jurisprudence. We have published uh, a volume of redacted awards. Uh, we want parties to know how SIC arbitrations function, but at the same time, uh, we are very protective of the confidentiality of SIC arbitrations and save for the most narrow of circumstances, we would not even be able to confirm uh, the existence of, of an arbitration proceeding under administration by SIC. Uh, so, Karina, any comments? Yeah, I would just comment that um, once now, now that SIC may get uh, more, more and more Brazilian cases, according to our Brazilian uh, Arbitration Act now, um, if you have a, a case against a state or against a state entity, um, it necessarily will be uh, public because of our constitution. So the institutions will have to make it accessible to the public and even like to, to publish the awards. Um, this also not in this way, but also happens that publicity, even in commercial cases that have confidentiality clauses, um, need, uh, ends up to, to being becoming public uh, because um, public owned companies, so uh, public traded company need to publish um, relevant uh, facts that may uh, have an impact on the pricing of the shares of the, in, in, of the, the, the shares in the stock option. And the, so uh, in the end, uh, information about the arbitration proceeding needs to be to become public. So this is a, a, a new trend because of course in Brazil, we have a commercial arbitration as a rule. We don't have a investment states case here in Brazil. So uh, confidentiality is always uh, the main rule. 
but uh, we are having discussions on, and, and, and this helps, as Kevin said, uh, uh, it, this helps to have access to uh, jurisprudence on, on, the sub, on the substance and even procedural matters. Um, it is important also for accountability of arbitration, but we are all, of course, aware of the importance of confidentiality for, for clients. So it is definitely a hot topic. Um, Karina, Karina, I, I should say we, we have a we have a recent case where there's uh, there's potentially a very large suite of of contracts where the parties want that same kind of uh, public transparency. So if you look at Rule Thirty Nine of the SIC rules, it makes clear that unless otherwise agreed by the parties, so parties are certainly able to derogate and customize uh, the transparency of an arbitral proceeding uh, at SIC. And, and that sometimes happens. And on the topic of confidentiality overall, it sometimes reminds me of an arbitrator who we probably all know, uh, who uh, when discussing confidentiality asks, how much different would it seem if instead of using the word confidential, you use the word secret, which I always thought was an interesting way of framing uh, the issue. Like everything uh, in institutional work, it is about finding uh, that right balance between protecting the confidentiality of of any specific proceeding and then transparency and building arbitration practice. So now we, uh, we open to questions. Uh, YK Shub uh, uh, said, uh, gave an interesting information that the Society of Maritime Arbitrators always publish all the arbitration awards in a booklet. Uh, uh, some institutions do the, those customize it and you have a very, ugly word like anonymize it uh award don't know a short extent the uh, SIAC does the same like publish the some awards uh, taking off the names yeah we, we had that um we had a redacted um publication of awards um i can't, I can't rem remember the year but it has been some time but we issued one um and we're exploring a possibility of of continuing uh, the redaction and publication of these awards. Yes, yeah, some so, institutions ask for ask for uh, the consent of the parties early in the beginning already of, of the proceeding on whether they could they would be willing to, uh, to they will accept uh, the publication of the award with uh, redactions. And I've also uh, uh, a very Brazilian um, uh, uh, thing that is happening because uh, Brazil is, is a peculiar place. And uh, now our commercial courts in Sao Paulo have decided that um, cases that are um, that, that cases that dealt with a pre-arbitration injunction should not be confidential because of course that if you have a, an arbitration agreement that says that the case is uh, under confidentiality once you need courts uh, to decide on a, a pre arbitration injunction you would like it to be confidential as well um the arbitration uh, the Pre brazilian procedural uh, procedural code even has um, a, a rule that establishes that arbitration cases would be confidential. Um, but uh, the commercial courts in Sao Paulo decided that, well, this is a judicial proceeding. Our constitution say that every case should be public um, in the judiciary. So this is giving uh, even more uh, strength for the parties to go directly to emergency arbitrators instead of um, of going to, to court for, for injunction if they need a interim relief, urgent relief. And uh, it is very important that some, some institutions just like SIC has uh, established a very uh, well and organized proceeding for uh, emergency arbitrators because then the parties feel confident to go and, and to adopt this proceeding. That's interesting because we, uh, first, like I was involved with the group that made this article of the Code of Civil Procedure about confidentiality. And I, and I strongly disagree with the Sao Paulo court. In yesterday, the Council of Judges issued a ruling about communication between the judiciary and arbitral proceeding. And, and one of the articles recognized the possibility of being confidential. So I think that's a peculiar thing of the uh, of a peculiar justice in, uh, in in the state of, of, of Sao Paulo because the highest court uh, issued a ruling saying that uh, uh, 
communications between arbitrators and uh, and the judiciary can be uh, confidential. confidential. But I couldn't agree more with you, Karina. If the 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 state of São Paulo starts re, uh, publishing uh, confidential uh, cases, um, some of my clients will, will go to emergency arbitrators. So uh, that's a way to take cases out of the judiciary. That's a pity. The judiciary should be competing with <laughs> with the arbitration chamber to get the good cases instead of uh, of giving more reasons for us to go to arbitration. I think like yeah. um, Karina pointed out earlier that we also, as an institution, need the consent of the parties before um, issuing these um, published awards. So it, it's it's really a challenge because sometimes even when the case is redacted, because the industry can be small, it's easy to identify these parties. And it's, it's really a balance like what Kevin said. And um, a big reason for some going through arbitration is really confidentiality. Hmm. In some, uh, in some cases, uh, like m &A case, I do a lot of m &A case, I know that Slav and Karina too, uh, you cannot discuss in court, like if you, uh, you have reps and warrants in an m &A agreement. Reps and warrants means that you're not paying tax, mean that you, uh, you have environmental issues, uh, it, it, everything that you discuss is extremely uh, sensitive. You don't want that in the first page of the newspaper. Uh, yeah. and, and going to arbitration will preserve, unless you need to uh, an injection in Sao Paulo. So it's better to go to SIAC emergency arbitration rules. So now I have 10 minutes to, to the uh, end. Uh, I would like to open the floor to the uh, to the audience to see if someone has a uh, has a question. Don't need to be in uh, in English if you want to, uh, to pose the question in Portuguese. There's no problem. Pode perguntar em português. You can ask uh, open mic or through the uh, through the chat. I guess while while people are thinking of questions, I I just want to invite um, um, our audience who may be more interested in arbitration if at SIC um, to sign up to our newsletters. If there are viewers that are under 40, we also have the young SIC committee. You are free to join and be more involved. Um, we have academies at SIC um, and we have a lot of training sessions like these, um, such as mock arbitrations and um, yeah, just, just a lot a lot of activities actually happening at SIC. So please feel free to join us. Um, you can also reach out to us for bespoke trainings. If there are particular um, topics that you want us to address in, in your space, in your firm, in your company, we're happy to do that. We're also all available. You can reach out to us um, if you have any other questions after this segment. Um, yeah, just a quick plug while people are thinking of uh, of questions to answer. I, I might have uh, my own question for any of the panelists mm -hmm. because I'm always always quite indulgent. And I was just wondering for uh, Joaquim, Flavio or Karina, early dismissal, uh, summary dis disposition. Uh, what, what is the, the view from Brazil? How, how have you guys been able to wield that as 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 counsel? This is another discussion in the Intertral Working Group. And of course we have this provision under the SIC rules, and I was just interested in all of your views. I would love to have that, because sometimes we have like 10 uh, items in the prayer of relief. And culturally speaking here, like you ask for everything to get something. Uh, if you could have like a early dismissal of the case saying like from 7 to 10, it's, it's BS. <laughs> and let's discuss what's important here that uh, that will uh, help the case be more efficient. Yeah, and the fact that you have it on the rules, I mean, it, it helps a lot because uh, the party won't be able like to, to challenge whether the, the, the court had, uh, had the, the, the competence to, do, to address that matter and to close uh, prima facie and, and early, uh, early dismiss some of the claims. Even afterwards, once the tribunal renders a decision, it is very good that you already have the path um, and the rules established for that. So the parties uh, 
cho have chosen to apply SIC, SIAC rules to, to their agreement. So it's very good that, that you have that. And um, I'm sure that, that for clients, um, it is uh, an additional an additional advantage. Uh, and, and this should be um, respected afterwards uh, by Brazilian courts. It would be enforced um, and, and, and it helps even like the arbitral tribunal uh, once they see that it's there, so they feel comfortable. Of, okay, it's not that I'm anticipating uh, the ruling. I, I'm entitled to do that before going to the end uh, of the proceeding and deciding everything together uh, in the award, in the final award. Yeah, I, to I totally agree with them, Kevin. And if I may add, I think it's perhaps it's a cultural thing here that we don't have that, as Joaquin said, we have to give all the arguments, request everything. Uh, so I find it very a very good feature and hope this can stick. <laughs> and as Karina said, I think it's totally uh, enforceable here. Well, Flavio, it was interesting. And, and you, Joaquin, uh, further to your point on seven to 10. So what's interesting uh, about our experience with, with early dismissal is how it's almost an equal split between early dismissal of both claims and defenses. And where it's most effective is exactly the striking out that you're talking about of those claims seven, seven to 10 that are outside uh, the, the arbitration agreement. And I could also apply that seven to 10 to ARB Med ARB. Karina, as I said, I can always circle back to, to ARB Med ARB. But sometimes in the mediation, you won't fully settle the dispute but maybe if there, it's a dispute with all sorts of variation orders, the parties are able to mediate that out. And then the actual arbitration that they go back to becomes uh, quite narrow. I think that what we're all looking for in arbitration is a way of somehow simplifying uh, the disputes and the claims, particularly when there's inflated claims or claims outside, outside uh, the arbitration uh, agreement. So we found early dismissal to be uh, a very effective tool and perhaps there's a vetting result as well. So we've had 42 applications, but you will sometimes see a party raising the specter of early dismissal. So a respondent in their response to the notice of arbitration will say that we attend, intend to file for early dismissal against the claimant's uh, claim on the basis of manifest lack of, of legal merit, or a claimant might do that to a respondent for its, for its counterclaim. That's great. I think there's uh, one last comment here to keep confidentiality. Some parties may not desire to hold arbitration hearing at the maximum chambers as they were to be seen by other parties. Kevin, uh, is this still the case nowadays? I don't know if you can see Adrian, that in the chat. Adriana, I might almost, I might pitch that to you because you have served as an arbitrator, I think in, in arbitration hearings at Maxwell Chambers. What, what has been your experience? Um, the, the experience right now is that more and more people are really going um, virtual, but if it's in person and holding arbitration hearings at Maxwell Chambers, it still, um, it still remains confidential. Like I, I remember even getting through the door, there's just a, a system where you can't just walk in if you're from the public. So that's very well protected. Um, the Maxwell Chambers is very equipped. You can't go to the hearing floors without access to it, um, there, um, it's, it's really uh, a safe process to have the hearings in person. Um, but similarly, now in virtual hearings, you have all the safeguards that you can have. And the last arbitration I ran as an arbitrator was completely virtual. And we had to install these safety procedures online to make sure that nobody's dialing in, listening in, recording um, the proceedings. So that's what we've done. I, I mean, we even went as far as asking um, one representative from one side and the other to, to send their representatives on each um, room so that they can guard against any of these security and coaching issues. Well, that, uh, but that, that's funny. Sometimes like you have in some uh, institutions here, uh, you don't know, uh, it's easy you have, if you have different, depending on, on the architecture of the place, like you cannot see each other, but sometimes you meet at the door or you meet at the restaurant during lunch and you see who else. 
<laughs> have cases or in the hotel in front of you. So that's not, uh, nothing is 100% confidential. Or, or sometimes, some, sometimes the, the hearings are so big and there's been a few of those at Maxwell Chambers where there's entire buses dropping <laughs> off each side because you might have a hundred uh, on each side. Uh, and right, be wow. right before, uh, Right before COVID, I think was one of the busiest uh, periods for uh, hearings at Maxwell Chambers. And one of the fun things about working for SIC and you've got all of the other administering institutions in Maxwell Chambers is that you never knew which top 25 arbitrator that you would see in the elevator. So as you're going up to work, it could be in a completely different uh, case. So it might be a, an ICC case, an LCIA case being heard at Maxwell Chambers in Singapore. It was always quite fun because it was a real uh, vibrant community, but as Adriana said, in in terms of the confidential confidentiality, uh, very tight security, soundproofing. Uh, they even have robots at Maxwell Chambers, so all the highest level uh, of of technology to protect uh, the confidentiality. But I don't know, Joachim, as you said, I don't know if you can avoid that restaurant issue because some of the popular restaurants around Maxwell Chambers, you look around and all you see are arbitration council and arbitration. But that's part of the experience. Yeah. <laughs> so, Karina, the floor is yours for the for closing remark. Yeah, thank you so much. I really, I, I really enjoyed the opportunity. I really wish that our uh, clients uh, have the opportunity to get to know better SIAC. Um, please uh, be in contact and uh, any, and and I hope to to be able to to share. Um, news very soon about uh, SIC commercial cases, commercial arbitration in Brazil, involving Brazilian parties. Adriana, what's your Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Joaquim. And I really want to say thank you to our very knowledgeable panelists. Um, I, I myself learned a lot about Brazil um, in this discussion. I want to thank Joaquim for the very effective uh, moderating of the session. Um, and of course, to everyone that has joined us and actively participated, thank you very much for sharing in the discourse. Please, again, do feel free to reach out to us if you have any other follow-up questions. We'd all be happy um, to address and um, issues that we can. So th this concludes um, our webinar for today. Uh, stay safe, everyone, and, and I wish you a good week ahead. Thank you so much.